and medicine um, at Stanford. And um, this is the second time that, that I have had the privilege of meeting Elsie. And the first time, uh, it was just so interesting. And I'm so glad that you're back um, here at DMICE. And um, another super interesting topic to, to, to talk about. So thank you again for coming and for everyone to listen to this. And um, take it away, please, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohan. Um, that was a very kind introduction. Happy to be here this early afternoon with you wonderful people. Um, it's always great to hear your ideas. So half of this time will be used just to show and discuss what um, I think about in my lab, but the other half is just open for discussion. So feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, I'm not tight on schedule at all for this hour. Um, so as mentioned, I am a vascular surgeon and a data scientist. Um, today I'm wearing my data scientist hat. Otherwise, I'd be wearing these scrubs, which, you know, are beautiful and all, but sometimes you got to get out of the OR to try to improve patient care. Um, so the agenda for today, and this is the first time I'm using this presentation format, so apologies for any um, mishaps. But the agenda for today is really to um, talk about uh, precision medicine, and I'll start with the definition of precision medicine, um, as well as to talk about some use cases in cardiovascular disease we use in the lab um, or have experimented with in the lab and some um, conclusions and thoughts about future directions. Uh, although I have an agenda, I do not have a financial one, um, so I have no financial disclosures. Um, so precision medicine, again, like big data, like machine learning, it's a topic that gets, the, it's words that get thrown around a lot. Um, and so in terms of its definition, um, I take from it, I, I define it kind of how the NIH um, has defined precision medicine for their main initiative, which is an emerging approach for disease prevention and treatment that takes into account a person's individual variation in genes, environment, and lifestyle, so that we're not talking about treating people based on averages, but taking into account multiple factors that can um, lead us to uh, getting the treatment um, and prevention of disease better, um, leading to better long-term outcomes. So although precision medicine is exciting, I think there are a lot of fields that have not quite got on the bandwagon, but cancer um, care and, and oncology in general um, has really taken it by the horns and you, we've seen some really great um, uh, work in this field, um, specifically in cancer. So causes of cancer, we all know that cancer is caused by multiple things like smoking, obesity, poor diet, sedentary behavior, and genetics. Um, in the field of cancer oncology or oncology and precision prior to this whole precision medicine initiative you'd have a di diverse group of patients hopefully you could diagnose the type of cancer they had and then you'd offer them one of three treatments whether that be chemotherapy radiation and or surgery but with tons of money invested and time and a focus on this idea of precision medicine, there are now ways to more precisely diagnose um, a patient's cancer type um, and then target therapy specific um, for them. And although this sounds great, there's actually data that's quite numerous um, in its um, scope about how um, precision medicine can actually affect outcomes for cancer therapy. So in this paper, specifically from a group out at UCSD, um, looking at um, precision medicine for cancer therapy, um, they describe um, this single institutional multidisciplinary multidisciplinary tumor board. Um, and the idea of this tumor board was to enable a comprehensive review of patient data, including molecular profiling and what's known as N of 1 treatment plans. That means that they would get, um, they would get as much data uh, from the individual as possible um, and then come up with treatment plans with um, chemo regimens that, uh, or radiation regimens that match with the patient's um, unique um, expression data. This included tissue and blood blood next generation sequencing, mRNA expression analysis, and as well as immunohistochemistry. In the end, um, in the study as described, they were left with 429 patients um, that were included in their study. This included about 62% of people who could be evaluated and matched to at least one drug meant, um, recommended by this multi-institutional multi, um, uh, uh, this tumor board, um, as well as 20% of these patients who are matched to 
all drugs that the tumor board um, had uh, recommended, including combination therapy. And interestingly, even though all of these patients were reviewed by the tumor board, almost 40% did not receive something that the tumor board had recommended based on the patient's um, specific profile, um, but instead uh, received um, chemotherapy regimens based on a physician's choice. When they look back at the physician choice versus um, what the patient's genetics or or, um, biological mark markers actually matched to, they found that there was a lot of discordance and that physicians often chose things that were unmatched or had low match. And the interesting thing is that this allowed to compare outcomes um, for patients who received um, tumor board recommendations based on their unique profiles versus those who didn't. And what they found was that in terms of progression-free survival and um, for the specific tumors, people who received the recommended medications and were well-matched had better um, progression free survival than those who just received the physician's choice of regimen, which often was not well matched. Um, similarly, when looking at overall survival, um, there was a significant difference um, for those who uh, received therapy that um, from um, where they matched all recommended recommended therapies versus those with um, physician choice or just uh, received part of the recommended um, medications. And so you can start to see why precision medicine can be exciting because at scale, when you're looking at um, finding individuals and matching them well to treatment um, algorithms, you can see potentially how um, you can significantly improve survival overall. So going to cardiology, I feel, and you know, the precision medicine is just becoming a thing and becoming more exciting in cardiology, but the research um, in this space has mostly been focused on large randomized trials, which is great, but it's a different approach. So cardiology and cardiovascular disease in general, very similar that the risk factors um, for disease include smoking, obesity, so lifestyle things, as well as genetics. Um, and you have this diverse group of patients, but mostly the idea has been, let's get a lot of patients enrolled in a ra randomized trial and figure out if this treatment is effective or not. Um, and the randomization process will make this a higher fidelity um, uh, result. And based on this, if we find a treatment to be effective, we um, you know, prescribe it to the right group of people. But what we are missing out on is that the in a randomized trial, you're really just getting average treatment effects, which means that some people will do really well um, from the treatment and some people might actually be quite harmed from the treatment. And so what, as it for precision medicine applications, you can imagine a case in which we can identify unique characteristics or unique subgroups of patients for which they will do really well and those who will be really harmed. And so then you can match them appropriately to treatments to improve outcomes. What about vascular surgery, the field that um, I spend most of my time uh, dealing with? Well, it's sort of crickets. Um, we, a lot of our data, unfortunately, is anecdotal. We have small patient populations. And um, in rare circumstances, we do have randomized controlled trials. Um, and so on one sense, you can say all the vascular or most of vascular surgery is precision medicine in that we're really looking at unique patient characteristics that will drive us to um, offer one surgery or another or not offer any operation. But at the same time, the data that we're using to make these decisions aren't that granular and that we paint broad strokes. And so for me, that the interest has been, how do we change this? How do we improve our ability to identify unique subgroups or identify people for which screening treatment um, can be more precisely applied? So in terms of use cases, I just want to describe two um, specific use cases of research we've done in the lab. Um, one that looks at cardiovascular disease in general and one that looks specifically at vascular disease. Um, so for this study, um, we the idea was um, the concept that cardiovascular patients are diverse. There are different subtypes of disease that we know intuitively, and this may warrant different approaches to treatment. Um, so the idea for this study was to evaluate the feasibility of identifying these unique subgroups using um, a lot of different types of data and, use, and applying um, machine learning algorithms known as unsupervised learning algorithms. So when I say heterogeneous data, I'm talking about data from uh, multiple different factors 
like clinical data, um, like blood pressure, medication use to genetic data, to lifestyle data and physical activity. Um, and unsupervised learning, um, a lot of people in this group are probably familiar, but just the 30,000 foot view is uh, it's there are different types of algorithms that aim to find patterns within the data without pre specifying um, any specific variables or a pattern to which you want the data to be structured. We use a very specific um, type of unsupervised learning algorithm for this study known as generalized low rank modeling. What this allows you to do is take a feature matrix, which includes patients, their demographics, clinical lifestyle, and genetic profiles, and then summarize them into two different matrices, which look at their latent features. So changing all of the heterogeneous disparate data types into small mathematical um, uh, numbers in a feature space. That then allows you to then look at these latent features and cluster them so that you can identify unique clusters of patients, and then to re-identify all the features that make those clusters unique. And so in this study, um, we use data from a clinical trial that included um, about a, a, over 1,000 patients who were presenting for coronary angiograms. And we had um, about 160 variables for each of these patients, including clinical, uh, genetic markers, environmental exposures, and physical activity. Applying our generalized low rank modeling algorithm, we were able to identify four different clusters uh, when we plotted them on um, a feature space. What was fascinating about this is, okay, we found four different clusters. That's interesting. What we never modeled were their outcomes. And so we took these four clusters and looked at, okay, what are are there any differences in the outcomes of these clusters? And interestingly, we found that um, Belonging to this cluster was a, each cluster was associated with a different risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, which in and of itself is quite fascinating. Um, we didn't pre specify any variables that this algorithm needed to use, but in its summary, it identified these four unique groups who had different um, cardiovascular outcomes. The other fascinating thing is that these patients had different genetic profiles. Um, so, red being hot means that. Um, uh, one cluster that that particular uh, genetic risk factor is uh, overrepresented in one cluster in blue, meaning that it's underrepresented. And these um, risk um, SNPs on the left represent um, risk of cardiovascular disease and peripheral artery disease. And you can see that it varies across um, clusters. And so when we looked, this is the idea of re-identifying what um, risk factors or what factors um, were in each cluster, it was quite fascinating as well. So in cluster one, we had a group of patients who were um, oldest amongst all the clusters. They had mo more comorbidities than anyone else. They were more likely to have peripheral artery disease. They were more likely to be smokers, and they had a higher risk of mortality. Cluster two included these young multi-ethnic um, individuals who almost exclusively all had diabetes, also had a more sedentary lifestyle, and um, had lower um, educational um, attainment and socioeconomic status. Cluster three and cluster four were closer to each other, but were different in uh, unique ways. So for whatever reason, cluster three um, involved a, a middle-aged group of individuals who um, often were not taking medications as prescribed, and cluster four looked like the healthiest in our cohort, but actually had a higher risk of major adverse cardiovascular events than cluster three. And one thing we found that was different was that in cluster four, they had a higher um, proportion of uh, patients with higher genetic risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and so as a clinician, if, you're, <laughs> if you've ever went to medical school, if you've ever taken care of these patients, this is all intuitive. And so the question is, like, why is this interesting? It's interesting because you can apply a machine learning algorithm to identify these clusters at scale. So you can consider if you're um, looking at population health and trying to manage a whole population of individuals, if you can quickly 
um, you know, parse them out into different types of um, clusters for which there might be different approaches to treatment, then you can potentially improve um, outcomes by being more specific about what treatment you offer. So, for instance, in cluster two with young individuals with diabetes and low socioeconomic attainment, maybe your approach has to do more with determinants of health, whereas in cluster four, these are people with healthy behaviors which you don't who you don't expect to have a high um, level of cardiovascular risk, but they ultimately do, and this might be driven by genetics. And so maybe you institute genetic screening for um, this cluster of individuals. So this um, is just one study of which um, had some fascinating um, outcomes, which is um, which is submitted and hopefully will be accepted <laughs> sometime soon. Um, so then the next idea is around vascular surgery uh, or vascular um, disease in general um, and peripheral artery disease specifically. So this is the domain and space I work in a lot, which is dealing with people who have atherosclerosis um, that builds up in the lower extremities leading to poor blood flow. This can lead to limb um, loss um, due to amputation from poor blood flow, or it can um, lead to multiple other things like um, cardiovascular death, stroke, et cetera, because this atherosclerotic buildup is kind of throughout um, the body. Um, it affects over 200 million uh, individuals worldwide, but it's generally underdiagnosed and often providers and patients don't even know what PAD is. And so they don't know to screen for it. They don't know that the symptoms um, that a patient's experiencing are due to this disease process. And so it um, leaves a lot to be desired in terms of how do we best identify and medically manage these people aggressively so they don't come to my um, office to have a procedure. Um, and it also costs a ton of money to treat these patients. And so again, the idea is, are there ways to identify these patients early on and um, improve their medical optimization? So during my postdoc time, I was very interested in how we could leverage electronic health records because it is the center of all that we do in the hospital and as um, in taking care of patients. And so it contains a ton of data and also it contains the opportunity to um, push data insights onto providers in you know, a way that's useful and not overwhelming, hopefully. And so this project uh, centered around using electronic health record data to automate detection of of vascular disease. Um, and so some of you, um, if you've ever worked with electronic health record data, if you know of what common data models are, may be familiar with this um, schematic, but it's the idea that electronic health records have tons of data and we wanna make the, that data useful. And one way to do that is to standardize um, data across different elements in the electronic health record system. Um, this is specific, specific to the Odyssey work group um, where they came up with the common data model known as OMOP. And so this is the common data model we use at Stanford for our EHR research. And the idea here was to take this common data model um, and transform our EHR data into a machine readable format, which is just a bunch of tables that we can join, et cetera, um, to then apply machine learning algorithms or just traditional risk factor models to then try to detect who has vascular disease or PAD specifically and who doesn't. The idea again being that because we're pulling data from the EHR, we can automate the running of these models and then um, alert physicians or even patients that they might be at risk of this disease and that they should be screened. To build these models, um, it we inputted a lot of EHR data. So um, to be specific, cases were defined as people who had a PAD diagnosis and controls were people who had no PAD diagnosis. For cases, we included da um, data up until 60 days before their PAD diagnosis to try to model the idea that we don't know if this patient has PAD, but um, we want to identify what risk factors uh, are suggestive of PAD. Um, and in controls, all of their data was included, although we also modeled using only 60 days of data or, or using data 60 days prior to their end of follow up. Um, and in terms of the data we used, it was EHR data, including vitals, lab, medications, diagnoses, procedure, codes, radiology reports, et cetera. And the task here was to classify, does this patient have PAD or not? 
So um, looking at our model performance, we first started with um, our traditional risk factor model. This was to say we predefined people who had hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, and we assigned points and said, if you have so many points as a cutoff, you have a high risk of PAD, and if you fall under that number, your risk is low. Um, and the idea here is that, like, I'm excited about machine learning, but maybe you don't need machine learning necessarily to get the best model performance. And so um, we use it kind of as a benchmark for what our um, other models will um, have in performance performance. Um, so our traditional risk factor models actually perform quite well. When you look at something as area on, like area on the curve um, to see how well the model discriminates between cases and controls, we reach AUCs of up to nearly 0.83. And if you look at calibration curves, how good is the model at modeling um, actual risk of disease across the population of interest, the calibration is decent. It's not perfect, but it's decent. So then we are interested in applying machine learning models, specifically uh, models like random forests, which are great at identifying features, um, automatically identifying features that are useful. So you can feed um, these machine learning models um, a lot of data that might be sparse and um, they're bet and random forest we found has been better at identifying good features and then coming up with models with good discrimination. And here, here too, we found that the models performed quite well, um, better than our traditional risk factor models with similar um, results in terms of the calibration. Now, what we don't model with machine learning or traditional risk factors is timing of healthcare. And this is where um, I was interested in applying deep learning to, because a patient comes in, they um, have a problem, they get a medication maybe, or a certain test, they come in months or days later or years later and have a different problem and diagnosis and et cetera. And so care is across time and not necessarily static. For our machine learning models and our traditional risk factor models, we're feeding just, um, the, all of the patient's data into these models, um, whereas what we really want is what happens to a patient over time, and if we model that, will that improve our ability to detect which patients have PAD and which don't? And here we found that our models performed really well, better than our previous models. And of course, um, for the data scientists out there, when you see AUC starting to approach one, you're like, that's definitely overfit. Um, and it might be. <laughs> um, we try to account for that by breaking up our data into different folds, but number one, we know that this model performs quite well, but number two, we know that we also have to validate this outside of our um, Stanford data to make sure that the performance that we're seeing is also um, as good as we think. Um, we also, because um, the models may be quite over, uh, more overfit than our other models, the calibration curves um, vary quite a bit depending on the different um, populations that are sampled. So while I was working on all this, I'm gonna, you know, build these models. I'm gonna implement them in the EHR, and then I'm gonna um, see how um, this does in terms of patient outcomes. Um, there was this wonderful paper that was published looking at the genetics of peripheral artery disease, and. For those who don't work in P the PAD space, like it's very rare for there to be actual good data about the genetics of vascular disease because we tend to, a lot of the studies prior um, tended to have smaller sample sizes, um, but this one was based on a newer data set known as the Million Veterans Program, um, which had the goal of enrolling 500,000 or at least 500,000 veterans um, in the United States and detailing um, a ton of data about them, including their EHR data, and also sending out surveys um, and supplementing all of that with genetics, which you can imagine is mind-blowing in terms of the amount of data that that includes and how you can start linking phenotype data with genetic data. And so um, with this publication, we finally had in you know, the field of vascular medicine and vascular disease um, results that showed that there were a panoply of genetic risk factors for vascular disease. And so it was this light bulb moment where um, I thought, okay, now we can use this genetic data and improve our EHR models because um, now you can maybe improve the specificity of the model by identifying 
all these unique genetic risk factors that a patient might have and identify um, these patients more specifically based on their genetic data. Um, and so in using, gen in using this type of genetic data and our electronic health record data, I had this idea that we would build this precision screening platform. Stanford um, has this precision health biobank, um, which has all this rich genetic data, or so I've been told, great, I have expertise in using electronic health records to build models, and then we're going to combine that, and we're going to be able to offer this to all patients who come to Stanford, this type of precision screening, now for vascular disease, but in the future for any number of diseases, and be able to really um, make a dent in uh, patient outcomes. And so when you look at genetic data, there's a lot of different ways to try to summarize that data or to use that data. You can do things like rare variants where you're looking at very specific um, and small numbers of ge um, uh, genetic risk, or you can look at something more global like a polygenic risk score. And I chose to use a polygenic risk score, one, because it's um, less costly, and two, because I think it's easier to translate um, across institutions institutions because um, you're looking at a smaller um, number of genetic risks. So when you build a polygenic risk score, the idea is to um, take either a handful of patients' genetic risk factors and summarize them and come up with a score, or you can look across the entire genome and summarize all the little risks that when added together may be able to um, detect risk of something like vascular disease on a um, uh, more um, efficiently. And so um, the idea was to take electronic health record data and then the polygenic risk score and combine them um, again to try to improve our ability to detect vascular disease and maybe even detect vascular disease risk early because we're born with our genetics and um, for the most part, um, you know, depending on our environmental exposures, they um, can speak to our disease risks overall. And so maybe you can identify the 40-year-old um, before they develop um, PAD. At least that was the thought. <laughs> Um, but this is where I ran into a lot of roadblocks, and um, maybe now I'm speaking to people in the audience who are building labs or um, thinking of building labs. So I had expertise in one domain. I found collaborators to try to um, uh, branch out that expertise, but there are a lot of things that I did not consider. So for one, despite you know, the touting of our precision health biobank, it only has very few patients. So like the million, million veterans program had 500,000 patients. Um, the, um, if you look at biobanks, like at Vanderbilt or UPenn, even they have tens of thousands of patients. And then when I did more digging, Stanford biobank has about 4,000 patients and doing chart review, I found about 50 with PAD. So I was starting to play with smaller numbers than I expected. The other issue I ran into was that I thought the biobank meant that all the genetic, all the data had been genotyped and I just had to pull the data for analysis. It turned out that no, um, they had samples that then each individual lab could pay money to then have genotyped. Um, and so I don't pipette. Um, I don't know how to do any of this analysis. And so it took um, a few months to figure out, um, number one, a collaborating lab that would help me transfer these samples into wells that could then be analyzed. And number two, to find a cost-effective uh, way to get these um, samples genotyped. Um, while Stanford has some genotyping services, they're quite expensive. And so um, we had to look for other partners um, around the Bay Area to help us with this. Um, and lastly, um, once you know, we got all the wells set up. Um, my postdoc, or the postdoc working in the lab, who um, was seminal in this work, had to leave the country due to the COVID-19 pandemic, et cetera. And so she wasn't around to help with figuring a lot of this out, which included the logistics of getting this these samples to a lab, which I just threw in the back of my car one day and drove down to the lab to hand them the samples to get the genotyping done. So it's all these little nitty gritty things that you figure out as you're trying to branch out of your research expertise. But 
after all that, all was said and done, um, we actually had some preliminary results. And these are very early, like two weeks ago, um, we were able to analyze this. Um, and so we haven't added the EHR component to it, but we had the genetic component. So again, it was a very small sample size, smaller than I expected, but it included 52 people with PAD and 229 people without PAD. Um, this was chart review. So, um, it was manual chart review, but I should have a caveat that says that these 229 controls, um, because PAD is underdiagnosed, it's not 100% guaranteed that these people don't have PAD. Um, but to the best of our ability, we looked through their charts to say to try to rule out um, a diagnosis of PAD. Um, most of the people are older. PAD tends to affect an older population, and most of the, or the majority of these patients were male. Um, and we know that symptomatic PAD at least um, tends to occur in males. And so this, you know, if you're working in a tertiary care center, um, that's more likely what you're going to see. All right. So then we looked at our genetic data and specifically the area under the curve. So if we just looked, if we just looked at the age, race, and sex, um, we achieve an AUC of 0 0.709, so 0 0.71. And then we added this polygenic risk score, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears that went into trying to even get the genetic data to do this. And we saw that it added something, but not a lot. So that was kind of depressing. <laughs> I was expecting like, you know, we we're going to add the polygenic risk score and it was going to tell us so much more about um, our patients. But, um, you know, that's science and that's um, trial and error. And at the same time, we're not discouraged by these results. We do see some Delta improvement. And so the idea will be to add the electronic health record data um, and to see if um, maybe with less um, EHR data, the, the genetic data will have a higher fidelity in discriminating cases and controls. So more to come on uh, this horizon. So, so some parting thoughts or some conclusions I've come to in doing a lot of this research is that precision medicine is really exciting. And I think there are a lot of um, awesome use cases that will come up in the future. But currently a lot of genetics, genomics, or what we talk when what we talk about when we think about precision medicine has more to do with the science of medicine and less to do with the practice. It's really rare to find use cases for which clinicians can take that insights from what a study did and then use it in their um, daily practice or um, tools and things that are actually implemented um, that people can use. And so there's going to have to be a lot more focus on how do we move from the science of precision medicine into the practice. Um, and then the other idea is that we'll have to develop more in developing these tools, we'll have to be very careful about the use cases that we're considering and the data that we use. So, because um, of where I am, who my collaborators are, the EHR and genetic data seemed like the easy thing to put together. But you can imagine, like, using <clears throat> applying precision medicine using data from social media or physical activity data that we're collecting from um, mobile applications. Um, and so I'm, there's a lot of new research in these fields, and I think that that's where um, a lot more uh, excitement is going towards. Um, and implementation is difficult. I didn't even really touch on the implementation piece um, in part of this talk, but I'm happy to talk more about that um, as part of the discussion. But um, at least for the EHR models, what we're doing now is doing a pre-implementation study where we're actually going out to primary care physicians, cardiologists, and say, and and um, presenting them with model results or mock model results and trying to get a sense of, number one, how likely are physicians to believe in our models? Do they think that, that what our models are, are telling them about a patient's risk of PAD uh, is true? Um, if we use black box models where we don't really know why the model says a patient's high risk, are they still likely to trust that? Um, and what other data do they need to trust our models? Uh, would they act on our model predictions? Um, and so that's where we're at. And after that, um, we're still working on validation studies to make sure that our models um, actually um, perform as well as we think they do by enrolling people um, prospectively. And lastly, the idea is to 
eventually work with Epic and other vendors um, to put these models into um, into the clinic and to see whether or not they have the impact that we expect them to have. And so with that, I say thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, 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 Tirosi, for that absolutely great presentation. And so I can actually start off with a question and I'm really actually um, curious to know a little bit about your thoughts of implementing this and how you how you how how do you think your research will become actionable um, and if there is actually scope for what you're doing to translate to other diseases apart from um, apart from just PAD. Yeah. So the. <laughs> The implementation process is difficult because you have to have money, identify stakeholders who care, and work with teams that can uh, make it happen. So in our specific use case, um, in talking to, so um, at Stanford, we have this work group that's interested in um, taking the AI models that are coming out of research labs and implementing them. Um, but this, this work group sits in Stanford Healthcare, the hospital system, not the university research system. And so what they've found is that they can get the hospital excited about quality improvement projects. So not you know, about genetics and science and precision medicine and wow, this is really cool um, that we can identify these patients, but does the do these models improve the um, quality improvement initiatives that you know Medicare might um, have incentives for? Um, does this model reduce our costs, improve our profits? So very business like um, metrics that they're interested in. So to to so to work in working with that work group, the idea is that we to finally implement these models, we actually have to come to tailor them to um, align more with hospital financial and business incentives. And so um, my current thoughts and what we're currently working to do is come up with um, like a broader system of models. So not just for PAD, but for cardiovascular disease in general. And there are multiple labs working on different models. And so can we combine efforts to develop multiple models that can say show up in one tab in Epic that says your patient has high risk of um, uh, PAD or your patient has familial hypercholesterolemia as one model that's being tested or your patient's not on a statin and should be on a statin and sell that as like this will improve patient outcomes. It will ultimately make Stanford more competitive. Um, it'll improve uh, medication adherence. And so then maybe the hospital would be more interested and help us implement these um, uh, these models and actually get to patient care. Um, in terms of the broader um, scope, um, while I am passionate all day about vascular disease, I really do want to see this apply to many different things. Um, and especially when you think of disparities um, in outcomes, um, can you deploy these models in a way that enables um, identification of people who are at risk who are not being identified because of um, lack of access um, or, you know, racial disparities that might lead to um, poor health outcomes, et cetera. Um, and so that applies to multiple different things. It applies to cancer care, it applies to cardiovascular disease, um, it applies to surgical care. And so um, I feel, and you know, again, this is more like putting my early faculty hat on, just focusing on the things that I can control and do and the data that I understand. And then hopefully, you know, as part of an R grant and a larger um, multi institutional um, project is how do we develop a pipeline that allows for people to add on their disease use cases and still um, come up with a product or tool that's useful for their um, patient population. Hi, Elsie. This is Mina. I'm a PhD student here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, you showed, uh, you used your, uh, traditional models, machine learning, deep learning, and yep. you had a, like a 60 day, uh, prior to diagnosis of PAD EHR data. 
Uh, did you use that for your deep learning model as well? Like, do you see any value of increasing the amount of data that would go into the deep learning model? And also, um, the second question is, when you uh, tested, what kind of model did you test your final, uh, you know, with the gen genetic information, the final slide that you had? Yeah. Uh, what model was that? So that the final slide was just a logistic regression. Um, like if you plop in these small number of variables, um, what is the performance of this model? Um, for the deep learning models, um, the, the they do tend to need a lot more data than the other models in, uh, to, to have better performance. Um, in terms of the days of um, data that we use, it was the same 60 days before diagnosis. Um, that's another area of research that we hadn't quite gotten into, which was if we, um, if we move that to include 10 days before diagnosis or, you know, two years before diagnosis, what these models, how will these models perform? Um, that variable um, will likely need to be applied to our general EHR models, but I'm more interested in how that variable performs if you have the genetic data. So if I have the genetic data, I only have 30 days worth of um, EHR data on a patient, will that genetic data improve the model performance versus if I have a whole year's worth of EHR data, the genetic data might not be that useful. Um, another question I had was, um, did you, uh, I mean, if the deep learning model can be um, um, explained, uh, we can, um, there's a way to get the top 10 or top 20, uh, you know, features that were important um, in the model uh, performance. So, were you able to kind of see um, what top features you got in across the different kind of models that you used? Yeah so, that, yeah, so there are a few ways to do that. Um, we haven't done it yet. Um, we've mostly focused on the performance of these models, um, this pre-implementation study of whether or not people understand it, and then the, the other piece of this research is the utility, um, looking at um, cost versus how useful these models will be. Um, I suspect in going through paper drafts, revisions, et cetera, um, we'll then finally sit down and focus on how do we make the deep learning model more explainable, but that is definitely a planned part of the research process. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Elsie, is it okay if I ask you a question? Of course. I was actually really curious about um, your discussion about the uh, Stanford Healthcare and it kind of reaction towards uh, implementing these prediction models. Uh, my question is, you know, are there already some clinical prediction models in place at Stanford? I would imagine so. And then, you know, what are people, you know, I know that you're just starting to look at pre-implementation acceptability of, of predictive models, but what have you found so far about, you know, what people's kind of reactions are to these things? Yeah, so, <clears throat> <laughs> it's like the emperor's uh, the emperor has no clothes or the emperor's new clothes. I can't remember what the exact um, reference is, but it's like there's all this stuff we talk about precision medicine, Stanford Yay, hoorah! But like, there is one model <laughs> that is currently implemented, and it has to do with death um and palliative care and when to offer palliative care to patients um and that is running off a server in a in one lab and then it gets piped into epic um as and then it just generates a list for the palliative care team to look at and to start um uh, addressing uh, palliative care needs. And that is it. Even though we have a ton, like there's, we've got a ton of labs who have developed all these great models, but the implementation piece is where everything comes to a halt, unfortunately. Um, and like I said, this work group is trying to, um, is trying to um, understand how to decrease that friction. 
Um, in terms of the um, implementation piece, um, so I, I am not doing those interviews. That's being done by one of our vascular surgery residents who's then going to summarize them in a qualitative format, and then um, we can start writing about that. Those interviews started last week, so we're very early in the pre-implementation uh, research process. Um, but the is, so I guess the interesting thing to share there is like we sent all these emails out to people like, hey, uh, we're we want to deploy these models, but we want to get your feedback um, on how we should deploy these models. Um, it probably went out to like a thousand people, and we probably heard from like. 10, 15 people. Um, so it's really, I mean, that's just to say that it's really hard to do these studies to pin people down. Um, but the people who replied are really interested <laughs> in this. And so it probably will introduce some bias into how um, these things are assessed, but at least for now, it's the best that we can do um, just to get some feedback. Because I think without feedback, you're kind of in this vacuum of believing what you're doing is um, super valuable. And so any feedback at this point would be helpful from the non echo chamber of my division, the, the various divisions I work in. It sounds like you're going to have some interesting results to report. So we'll look out for that paper. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm excited that we got to this point. <laughs> I'm excited that there were volunteers. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Ross? I just went through chat and I don't see that case. Give folks, I think, 10 minutes of their time back. Thank you so much, Elsie, for taking the time to um, to come and chat with us. I think this is really useful. And I think from for me, just this idea of having these trains of you know, models, just not just for one disease, but, you know, the smoker who has hypertension, who has peripheral vascular disease, who has COPD, all of it kind of bundled together in a way that's meaningful. That's just, you know, that's a super exciting. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for your time and look forward to future conversations and continuing to learn from your group and others. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. I'll go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you for joining our conference today. Thank you, no problem.